Hello, everyone. Welcome to BungaCast and our 400th episode. This is the Global Politics Podcast at the end of the end of history. So since 2017, we've been exploring the contours of a new world, or rather an old world in advanced decay. The end of history that followed the closing of the Cold War, the collapse of state socialism, and the historic defeat of the working class itself was ending. So we've argued for the past seven years. So we've been interested in charting populist challenges, the end of U.S. hegemony, emerging multipolarity, the failing authority of neoliberalism, and the erosion of aspects of public life that we've inherited from the 20th century, ones which we can't any longer really take for granted. So most of this found its way into our book, The End of the End of History, Politics in the 21st Century, which came out in 2021. What we want to do now is take the next step. So we're putting out more episodes, around two a week, and expanding our coverage from arts and culture to science, industry, and the built environment. We've also partnered with Damage Magazine, and uh, well, and this last bit I'm really excited to present. Today, uh, we've brought in some of our favorite guests as regular contributors, who you can see here if you're from watching us on video. <laughs> I'm going to assume that you're new to BungaCast and take the opportunity to uh, introduce ourselves, um, Alex, myself, George, and Phil. So, um, Phil, why don't you go ahead first and introduce yourself? So, I'm Philip Cunliffe. I've been with the pod from the start, and I'm a international relations academic. I think that's probably in. I think that's probably enough for me. <laughs> George. Yeah, so I'll just jump straight in. So yeah, I'm George, one of the other um, original from the beginning um, OG hosts of of BungaCast. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a political theory is the sort of stuff that I like, not IR. Um, yeah, so but we have we have a an expanded team now. Indeed, we do. Indeed, we do. So um, I'm Alex Hokuli. I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm a political analyst and writer. Um, I guess a sociologist of sorts. Um, but I also like international relations. Lots of things catch my interest, um, some of which make it onto the podcast. Um, right. So um, as I said, we've brought in these wonderful contributors. There's four of them, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. So uh, I guess first, Alex Gurevich. Hi, I'm Alex Gurevich. I am living in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I am a professor of political science at Brown University. And my sort of main area of interest is political theory as that relates to issues like work, freedom, and uh, as it touches on other areas, leisure, that kind of thing. Hi, I'm uh, Amber Ali Frost. I'm a writer and uh, erstwhile podcaster from uh, Chapo Trap House. Um, I am a filthy Americanist and I just got out of the shower. Hi, um, unlike these guys, I'm Catherine Liu and I'm into national relations. Only joking. I'm a professor of film and media studies at UC Irvine and I'm in Southern California. And Lee Phillips. Hi there. Um, my name's Lee. Um, I'm a science journalist. I'm also the author of uh, two books, uh, Austerity Ecology and The Collapse of Porn Addicts and uh, co-author with uh, economist uh, Michal Wozworski, The People's Republic of Walmart. And in a few months, I will be a geologist. That that rocks. That's the, the uh, first and last time I'm going to do one of those. Oh, my God. Um, anyway, so <laughs> all of these people, uh, myself, the George and Phil, and our four new contributors, we're all going to be appearing a lot on BungaCast shows. Um, so... We hope you'll, of course, join us at patreon.com slash bungacast. Uh, to let you know, subscribers for $7 a month get at least four exclusive subscriber-only episodes a month. And $12 subscribers also get access to the Bungacast Reading Club, where we explore books and essays 
both contemporary and classic, that present key ideas to understand our world today. Also, if you sign up uh, for a whole year now, uh, you'll be entered into a raffle to, to win a BungaCast t-shirt. Um, they're really cool, and you should wear them. They are. Um, they're good quality as well. They have a, that kind which of is heavy important. cotton. So, yeah. yeah. They're going to last you. Substantial. And they've got, the they still got the face of our dearly departed patron saint. So that should also be noted, I think. Indeed. They are real conversation starters, I should I listeners should know <laughs> yeah tell us tell the us. average person on the street is very confused <laughs> <laughs> well if that's Why what you want to go you for you know that's what you need with a shirt that says bunga cast on it and silvio berlusconi that's it um, that might be the experience from cambridge massachusetts alex though like you know and maybe not maybe less so elsewhere yeah fair oh, enough it assumes if you wear it right on the streets right. of milan you know with a fashion capital uh, as well then uh you see what the reaction would be there uh anyway so um also you know make sure you rate and review the podcast i always forget to say that but apparently you know it's important and you should say it or you know just tell your friends which is also cool anyway so what are we doing here today um all seven of us uh, we want to reflect on the next decade so um just to catch you up again if you're new to the podcast uh 2016 where it saw the election of Trump and Britain's referendum to leave the EU, uh, marked, uh, according to, well, according to us, uh, the end of the end of history, um, though that whole order had been falling apart since the 2008 crash. And at the level of consciousness and ideology, uh, the idea that liberal democracy would be forever and that the whole world would gradually adopt that model um, started no longer to hold. Um, I don't think anyone would maintain that today, in fact. Um, the 2010s then were kind of the story of populist challenges to neoliberal technocracy that came from the right and from the left. We've talked um, since 2019, really, a lot about the failures and the defeat of left populism or of the millennial left. This was followed by the pandemic and the lockdowns and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so kind of looking at the world today, kind of backwards and forwards, you see the return of inflation, growing geopolitical friction, and the co-optation or incorporation of right populism into the establishment, which is where we're going to start in just a second. So I want to what we want to do here, really, um, in 2024, and, and specifically in this episode, is to reflect on the next decade. Um, but we don't want to just get into speculation and futurology, uh, because that tends to be quite dumb. Um, what we actually want to do is uh, examine sites of tension and key oppositions that we think will structure the politics and economics, society, and culture of uh, the coming years. So we've broken this down into four different areas. Firstly, politics. Secondly, art and ideas. Thirdly, industry and economy, and then finally, individual and society. So we're going to go through these um, and the various oppositions and tensions within them and try to uh, kind of explore the kind of contradictory aspects of today and how they, how we see them kind of playing out into the future. So um, to get started, um, the first question, I guess, is, is of populism, which is, I guess, where this podcast started. Um, it's what we were interested in exploring right from the start. So it's, it's nice to kind of double back on that seven years on and to examine where we are um, after, after the populist decade and after a period in which it seems like populism has become part of the furniture in a way. Um, everyone, whenever there's a populist insurgency um, outbreak or some um, success at the polls, it seems to follow pr the pretty similar model that it has elsewhere, whether you're in the Netherlands or Portugal or Argentina or Hungary or Turkey or um, indeed India. In many ways, a lot of these kind of phenomenon, um, phenomena sort of, um, they're quite similar to each other. They follow a certain script um, in terms of uh, the kind of progressive establishment reacting against it, um, often hysterically. Um, they come into power, maybe don't actually achieve very much. Their main um, contribution politically seems to be uh, often in the realm of culture because um, much more difficult to shift political institutions and structures uh, and economic uh, modes of governance are kind of hard things to change. Um, and very often they don't have the substantial base and movement to, to really force through change. So kind of what I want to start off by asking is whether we think the trend of co-optation of right populism will continue. So if we can think, for example, like, especially in the EU and Europe, like of uh, Giorgio Meloni, part of a post-fascist party, which a lot of people were scared about, but at the same time is pro-NATO, pro-EU, um, takes all the kind of boxes in terms of what the establishment wants to see. And this seems to be happening across Europe. And indeed, maybe the return of Trump is going to prove this point as well. So um, is the new right going to become the establishment? Um, is there a, an elite vibe shift going on, as we discussed uh, in, a, in a recent episode? Um, 
are corporations and institutions going to adapt and adopt a sort of new ethos moving on from kind of um, the, the touchstones of, of progressivism, of uh, particularly of wokeism over the past couple of years? Um, and how does the conflict between the establishment center right and the insurgent new right or populist right play out, which is another kind of key source of tension? So um, I guess to, to start us off, um, Alex Gurvich, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, it's a good question. I've been, I keep revising my uh, opinion about this issue. And it's because it's a little hard for me to tell whether when you compare right populism to less populism, left populism, it seems like the right actually has more anti-institutional energy than the left. If you think of the left populists, they have been far more cautious about mounting any robust challenge to existing sort of constitutional structures, even when presented with the opportunity. I mean, the left in the UK had the chance to make a strong argument for Brexit and they backed away and the right kind of seized the ground. Um, Bernie Sanders political revolution, that's the name he gave to it, was barely uh, uh, really willing to challenge anything constitutional party structural. And so on the one hand, uh, from that standpoint, the rights looked far more willing to be anti-institutional, less willing just to be incorporated. On the other hand, it's sort of once the right populists uh, gain power, what is right populism? It ends up being a way for the right to win an election and then imprint itself on the least democratic institutions available to it. So what, mm -hmm. what, what's the institutional legacy of the Trump presidency? It is uh, the Republicans embedding them in and committing even more vigorously to the undemocratic aspects of existing institutions, the Supreme Court appointing huge numbers, unprecedented numbers of judges, institutionalizing their tax cuts, um, you know, uh, really organizing their politics around trying to win presidency through, through the Electoral College. And then you see in Europe that in a way, right, you know, the right wing populists have been absolutely at home in the EU. And so in that sense, they redouble their commitment to existing institutions. And I think that's because prevailing institutions are, are not entirely, but there are plenty of available institutions that are anti-democratic. And that's enough for right populists. I'm not sure it really makes mm. sense to call it incorporation at all, since I think in the end, right populism is not particularly inst institutional. It is a way in which the right, which is naturally a minority, wins elections and then does whatever it can to empower the most anti-democratic institutions within existing constitutional frameworks that already exist. So I suppose that's sort of my initial thought about the right populism and yeah. this kind of place. That's why it's at home in the EU, for instance. Yeah, I, I think we'll just keep like snaking around here um, the way these screens are laid out. Um, Phil? Yeah, so... I think I would differ from Alex. I think the um, I think the I think there is. I mean, they are basically being incorporated, and that is most evident with Georgia Maloney. So the fact that the um, and it's less to do with I think the nature of uh, their relationship to institutions so much as how other political actors and other social actors are responding to them. And I think this is kind of perhaps most evident with The Economist, which, you know, um, was willing to send all the kind of um, fanfare about the return of fascism in Italy and the end of global liberalism and so on at the prospect of a Maloney government, but since then has been very um, cool and accommodating and even congratulatory about particularly regarding her pro, very staunchly pro-war stance over Ukraine and her negotiations with the um, European Central Bank. So the European Union is a very um, welcome and warm home for um, for the populist right. And so that seems to me to speak to the fact they're being co-opted. Um, and as a result of that, I think, you know, that, that indicates some um, that we're probably going to see more cooperation between the center right and um, the populist right. So Geert Wilders has been still been excluded from forming a government in the Netherlands, and there's still talk about uh, keeping the AFD out of any kind of uh, coalition governments at the level of the state of uh, local elections in the state in Germany. Um, 
but notwithstanding those, I think we'll probably see more complementarity, more coalitions and more um, political integration. And that seems to me that all of the populist um, all of the populist rebellion and insurgency is effectively it's effectively gone. And I just reading the way in which, um, say, the liberal mainstream press is um, weighing the prospect of a possible Trump presidency, a second Trump presidency. It seems to me they're you know they they just can't get they can't put their heart into the same. Uh, rigmarole about um, the end of civilization and the end of the world and the end of fascism, oh, sorry, the return of fascism as they were before, because they can, because um, they know they're going to make money and they know they can kind of write it out. And also they realize it is a very different world from the world in which Trump was elected in 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it's true that and I think any example that you think of or you might go, no, but there's a, a kind of rebellious energy on the populist right. Um, right now in Ireland, I think it's probably the, the latest one, um, which hasn't yet found a, a political home. Even there, you think, well, that'll end up probably most likely following the same script that, that it followed elsewhere. Um, we know that script very well by now. Uh, Lee. Yes, I guess there's more of a, a question to Alex and maybe Philip as well. Um, if the, the, the sort of theory here or the hypothesis is that these right populists are able, to, very able to um, incorporate themselves into the European institutions. Um, how do you uh, analyze the sort of recycling of different uh, right populist formations? So for example, there's, you know, you've got the five star movement. Is that right? Is it left? It's a sort of complicated question there. Then you've got the Lega, but then now we've got the Fratelli Italia. So there does seem to be some sort of limitation of what they can do before being recycled. And even in, even in, um, in the Netherlands, uh, while they haven't come to power yet, they're uh, dating back to the early 2000s. You had Pimpor Town, and then a few years ago, I can't remember the name of the party, but it was headed by a young guy, real sort of um, quite a chauvinist sort of figure. And now we have um, uh, Geert Wilders. And even in France, there was a moment there where would Eric Zemmour um, sort of overtake Le Pen? So I guess that's my question is how do you incorporate this sort of I guess recycling isn't quite the right word, but it certainly is the right word in Italy, where you have this movement of different uh, far right formations, or not far right, the hard right formations. Yeah, no, I I, I think that kind of recycling is is probably the right term in a lot of these cases. Um, Amber, at this point, my questions, and I, I don't have any conclusions on this. Maybe I would if I was, you know, digging into international politics, or, but um, it's trying to figure out who is the rear garter in terms of uh, populism and who is actually taking the lead, I think I would I would agree. I, I, I would say that parties in general are becoming uh, less relevant uh, on both sides. I think that, I don't know, it's very strange because again, I sort of come from the, the protest uh, end of things or, or that was my sort of last, um, or my first actual uh, interaction with stuff, which is strange because I sort of remember right populism actually accomplishing things, at least in terms of integrating itself uh, into into government proper. I remember the the Tea Party and stuff like that. Um, it is also very funny. I I, I feel so uh, irrelevant. Uh, sort of, I'm glad the the Bevins book has come out. I really want to read it, but I haven't yet. But I feel so irrelevant referring to populist movements in terms of protest. I feel like a like a milliner or someone who sells stagecoaches or something. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we've gotten to the point where I think most of us established that, um, you know, the PMC or, or whatever are uh, operating the party, but uh, the non, you know, the Democratic Party but then there's this entire group of people who sort of used to be loyal to the Democratic Party, but then whatever progressive movement there was, was kind of rear guarding any kind of left push, or they would have if we had been more powerful, I think, as Alex said, is if, uh, if Bernie Sanders actually had moved the needle. I can't tell who's, uh, who's in front anymore. 
uh, on either side. That's very, it's, I don't know who's in charge and I don't even know that um, there's competition for that or if they've reached a sort of, um, you know, in terms of like non-governmental institutions or quangos, whatever the fuck you call them, um, you know, the NGO world or whatever. I can't, uh, I can't figure out who's in charge. And that to me is the most interesting part of right now. Catherine. Um, so I like to take a more historical view of this. Um, and for me, the touchstone of understanding populism in its reaction to modernity and as a very prototypical class war is the People's Party of the United States. And the coalition that it was able to, um, it was a third party um, challenge against the um, dominance of the Republicans and the Democrats at the end of the 19th century after there was a terrible drought and um, the railroads were you know, choking the life out of farmers in the middle of America and the South as well. And there was a moment when it was also an interracial coalition and it was a sort of intimation of this kind of rebellion against um, not only monopoly capitalism, but also this rise of this kind of managerialism and a professional management of conflict and class conflict that um, the Midwesterners and the Southern um, farmers and the petty bourgeois coalitions saw coming. And what they demanded was the government intervention with the establishment of land grant universities that would break the stranglehold of elite universities in the East Coast, which didn't happen. And then um, also just an incorporation of um, checks and balances on um, debt and on um, land speculation. So it was a spectacular um, expression of massive political discontent gets reincorporated into the Democratic Party. And I keep seeing this, you know, sort of reflect in our times, we have legitimate grievance against this thing called the bureaucracy. And the left comes out with a kind of libertarianism that in you know, counterculturalism that I think a lot of us here are very, very skeptical of, but the right wing also has its critique of monopoly capitalism and bureaucracy. And it's like a deep, deep um, well of discontent. And this happened with Brexit, this happened with, um, you know, the right wing populists in the um, EU. And what this, what the class does, the professional manager class or the petty bourgeois bureaucrat does is now, manage crisis and inequality. And every once in a while, there'll be a burst of hatred of this kind of management. And there will be real demand for the mitigation of inequality, the redistribution of resources. And unfortunately, we're at a time when we see all of that fading. And what we have is a lot of politics LARPing as a kind of anti um, monopoly capital, anti-finance capital kind of thing. Um, the weakness and the defeat of the left of the teens was terrible. But you, but I think that the right wing, right populism today, um, incorporated, exhausted as it is, is much more cathartic with regard to its rejection of um, bureaucratization and managerialism of inequality. I mean, the whole thing about right-wing populism right now almost seems to be a direct reaction against the kind of exhausted liberalism that we know is, the Israel-Palestine thing is a great example of this. Liberalism and its ideals have been exposed as you know the most vicious kind of Hobbesian Machiavellianism and um, profit-taking. So the right-wing is still rebelling against those liberal norms and you have this like weak to milk toast liberalism that's trying to defend norms like human rights or peace or equality and none of that is working so popular boiling boiling discontent is like for me it's like this magma that um the right wing knows how to channel right now and as alice gorvich said bernie sanders channeled that to a certain degree but he was afraid of the explosive potential and the volatility of that anger so there's no revolution. He was like a political reformist. Like revolution is ugly. It'll bring you to ugly places. And the left liberals always like step back from it because we always think we can manage better than other people. Mm. And well, yeah, we, that, we, that, we yeah, that instinct to manage. 
Yeah, we, and now we have this fucked up world that we've managed into this just um, polarization and this magma of hatred, anger, rage, and um, rejection of liberal norms that have failed spectacularly. I don't yeah. know if that answers any questions. But no, no, but just we're idea. just getting we're just getting started. So, um, you know, uh, George. Yeah, last last but not least, I mean, it's in some ways it's good to go last because you can insinuate that everybody else's answers were problematic because they didn't mention the thing that you um, <laughs> are going to mention. Um, no, I mean, a lot to a lot to agree with, I think, in what, what everyone's been saying. I mean, if I take there's almost like a common theme that 2016 to 2024 was was the populist decade. I mean, it's a short decade, but, you know, decades, centuries, they're a bit, bit malleable uh, of them. But it's not going to be quite the same. We don't have that We've talked on the, this podcast before about, you know, the the emotion of anger being being perhaps the defining one of the populist decade. And so what will it be when these kind of right populist uh, movements are co-opted? Um, is it going to be a resentful withdrawal? Is it going to be a, a kind of defeatism? Um, because I definitely agree with this idea that, you know, if particularly in the European context, if there's a litmus test of right populism, it's are you prepared to go against the EU? They're not. Um, and so, yeah, I think in some ways we're at the same sort of situation in, in essential terms as we were in, in 2016 or, or when we started this podcast in 2017, and I better get that date right, which is <clears throat> populism doesn't ultimately solve the problem of representing people's grievances. You have farmers protests all across Europe, for example, at the moment. Does the right really want to take that magma, as um, Catherine put it? Well, it's going to be a bit hot to handle. You you want to manage and and, and disseminate that. Um, no, sorry, disseminate uh, handle the, the 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 heat, and um, rather than actually kind of channel it into something potentially um, explosive. So yeah, I mean that's I mean to to return to the sort of question, if it if it was like what what's going to define the politics of this coming decade? I think it's going to be how the right populists in particular attempt to manage all this all this kind of leftover anger that we still have from the end of the end of history and how you know how that's not going to be successful and what are the kind of eruptions to continue that kind of volcanic analogy that we might have um as a consequence of that kind of management with management without representation which is you know never going to be successful I think that's right. I mean, I don't think, I don't know if anyone's here is th saying, well, you know, the populist decade is over. And that also means that kind of all politics goes back in its box. Like we're back in the 2000s because I think the conditions of the 2000s are very much not there. Um, growth is very low, slow, if at all there, right? Um, geopolitically, things keep shifting. And so that kind of throws things up in the air in a way that wasn't the case in the kind of high point of American um, unipolarity. So on the one hand, it, it feels like, you know, it's tempting to be a bit despondent because even if you're not a fan of uh, right populism, for example, um, it still it was testament to the fact that um, people were revolting in some way. And it, and I think, I mean, we've discussed on this podcast before, whether that's kind of, that's all over, you know, where you can kind of close the book on the, on a kind of the long 2020 excuse me, the long 2010s in some way or not. And I've always held that, no, that isn't the case because new things will keep springing up because those resentments and disgruntlements and frustrations, whether it's directed at um, kind of the managerial class, directed at bureaucracy, directed at, um, you know, small business owners, directed at monopoly capital, whatever it might be, um, or indeed um, even uh, working class frustrations and, and um, demands for better you know, conditions or uh, in defense of welfare or whatever it might be, those kind of will, you'd imagine, keep springing up. Um, but I wonder, you know, if, I mean, I don't, we're probably not all agreed here, but if populism has shown as, as it has existed up till, you know, in the 2010s, um, as, a, as incapable of really representing people's interest and at most just representing a certain or transmuting those disgruntlements onto the cultural terrain, if it's only able to do that, where does that frustration go? Um, we haven't even talked about the left, right? Which I think is in itself telling. 
um, I put that in there in the kind of agenda of what to discuss, but it was kind of like threw in the left because we have to discuss it r rather than a sense that it imposes itself as something that we need to discuss, you know? What's um, to say? It's our, it's our responsibility. It's our duty to, to discuss the left. We have to, uh, to solemnly, um, to, to take that on. But no, I guess I, I think, you know, we started by talking about right populism. I think that's probably because well i don't want to speak on behalf of now seven not not just three people and say that we think you know the right has more of that anti-institutional energy it has more of the you know the the things are happening it seems at this from this vantage point more on the on the right at the moment than than the left so it seems more natural to start with that that kind of discussion perhaps but Catherine. Um, I was going to sort of play devil's advocate with Alex G's statement about um, the right populists embedding themselves in anti-democratic institutions. It, it, that's definitely happened. But at the same time, as you look at the history of populism and the rise of capitalism, every time there's a paroxysm of populist energy, the, the, po the political participants in the field expand. So the number, and I, and that happened in the 19th up, up into the early 20th centuries. So people who felt like they had a, people who were completely marginalized from the political field, um, rural Americans, I keep coming back to the Americans, but um, they expand, they expand, they felt like they were invested. Even in Latin American politics with the Caudillos and the Peronistas, people who saw themselves in a political figure um, moved into the political sphere. I feel like right now we're at a kind of populist stasis where populism doesn't expand the um the people who are um participating in democratic fields and this is why we seem to be talking about um um industrialized western countries non-autocratic countries because it would be really interesting to think about all of these questions with regard to china or um russia at this point but let's not do that right now so let's say like let's say like it it doesn't really expand the political field. It only inflames certain elements of the political field that remain apathetic when there is no populist insurgency and then emerge uh, to become like mobilized, to mo mobilize itself as these left vanguardists keep thinking like there's going to be some kind of mass mobilization that happens. And this goes with the uh, Canadian uh, truckers, the Gilets jaunes, the, the AFD, fortunately or unfortunately, people have been politically apathetic like are are moved to um, do something and enter the political field at that time. So you think, is this anti-democratic? I think the liberals have become anti-democratic because they feel like every time there's an insurgency like this, they say they're fascist. So how do you say, so we must exclude them. We're all for inclusion, but we cannot have these fascists participating politically. So just to be a little bit of the devil's advocate, like, are we actually like, you know, um, looking at the expansion of the political field, just. No, that's a good. That's a good way. That's a good way to put it. Um, I think Amber and then Lee and then Phil. I think those are really interesting. Once again, I I hate to even jump in this much because it, it a lot of my conclusions just end up with I don't know, but I think to get back to uh, you know sort of Sanders and the idea of revolution, like it's not clear to me that that's what any of Sanders' base even really wanted um, or what anyone wanted out of the last election. I also think it, it, it doesn't really make sense to think of Sanders as a populist movement. Maybe that's unfair, but it was a youth movement, primary, at least proportionally, which was part of, part of the problem. Um, and I'm not sure what counts as participation right now, at least in the U.S., we've got this uncommitted voters uh, sort of, I don't want to say movement, um, but people voting as uncommitted. And I don't know if that's a flash in the pan or a Green Party thing, but it does seem like at the very least, people are not voting, you know, super liberal. They're not voting Green Prius. Um, they are voting to not vote. And to me, that seems like a real form of participation, um, at least something different. Um, also, I, I, you know, it's difficult to say because there's no real left in the U.S. And I know that this is sort of different in different places. Um, but I, I think in terms of 
like Israel is, is very difficult to ignore right now. But you see the same kind of repetition of it, it, it is a little sad and I, you know, of, of protest and, and, you know, mass outrage that I think counts at least in terms of numbers as as at least a populist subject. But to what Catherine said, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff being like, you know, we don't want help from the anti-Israel right. And I get that a lot of that is, you know, because they're crazy people, a lot of them, particularly the the, the major cultural figures. But, you know, it reminds me of Greece when there were coalitions being built between, you know, left parties and right parties that were anti-austerity. And people are like, how dare you vote alongside them? And it speaks to this idea that you know, what Adolf Reed calls the ostensible, putative, uh, you know, aspirational, not really there left, um, trying to build platforms um, uh, or or parties or, or unified, you know, almost communities of people with shared values, rather than sort of moving forward with, um, you know, project by project politics. Um, which, you know, there are, there are no real communities, particularly like think about Sanders, what, what language did he use? He was like, we're talking about these communities, that communities, I think, you know, uh, retrenchment, deindustrialization and all those things destroyed what could be called a community. Moreover, um, his base again was, had an outsized youth population and, a, and young people aren't a community. A community has, a parents and children and the elderly and, uh, you know, a, a wide range of people, even if there's some sort of like ethnic or, um, you know, you're, you're looking for the graphic. word diversity. You're looking for diversity. right, 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 right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I apologize because this brings me to no conclusions yet again. <laughs> But yeah, but I mean, you know, if the, the, the condition of, of at least 21st first century populism was the hollowing out of political parties and a way of trying to do politics and channel anger um, upwards in some way. I think in that regard, that problem hasn't been resolved in any way. It's not like parties have been built. They've continued hollowing out. So in that regard, you know, populism remains the kind of shadow to technocracy. And I, I don't see that going away, I guess, um, unless people find that we've done this too many times and there's no <laughs> that it that it somehow uh, political energies or or just even not even kind of pre-political energies are directed elsewhere lee yeah i was just going to respond to um uh, your earlier comments alex h and uh, george's with respect to the sort of constraints upon uh, the, the the constraints that uh, right populists uh, confront upon coming to power um that they haven't actually fundamentally resolved the um the discontent that the 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 economic discontent that actually is the is the material fundament of all of, all of this, um, and I think that, that I mean this is just an idea. I, 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 when I said earlier that I had a question for Alex G around this, it wasn't that I think this is a counter. I, I wasn't disagreeing. It was I genuinely don't know, but perhaps it is the case that uh, the ra the reason for this re sort of recycling of different uh, right populist uh, formations. Um, and perhaps we'll see that on the left as well, a uh, revival of, of left populism in some new form, is that upon coming to power, whether at the, at the national level or even at uh, regional uh, municipal level, there is a hard constraint, uh, both institutionally with respect to the European Union, about what one can actually do, but more internationally, uh, beyond the, the European Union, um, for any country of a you know relatively small uh, sized economy, there are um, there, there are fiscal, there are international capital constraints on what can be done uh, in a globalized economy. Now, perhaps looking forward um, with the new sort of industrial policy moment where the Biden administration really has opened up brand new terrain about uh, the ability for the state to intervene, that, I mean, I do think we'll see what happens. I mean, he, maybe he will lose um, in, 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 in the next election, but that has forced the European Union to at least begin having sort of conversations around industrial policy, breaking with a sort of neoliberal market fundamentalism, at least to some extent. Um, and if that, <clears throat> that moving forward, that potentially does allow right, then uh, sort of a, maybe a new generation of right populists uh, to actually respond to that economic discontent. But then of course that also opens up new terrain for the left as well. The one of the reasons why um, you know, Podemos and uh, Syriza 
um, crashed, crashed and burned was the fact that upon arriving in power, there wasn't much that they could do uh, to respond to that. Partially because, they, again, these are you know, uh, European Union institutional constraints, but also um, just these are relatively small economies in, 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 in the world. It will be interesting to see what happens when if the AFD begins to uh, form some sort of coalition um, in, in Germany in a moment uh, when industrial policy is suddenly you know, uh, allowed and Germany is a much larger economy. So there's much more room to maneuver there, potentially. Phil, I mean, I don't know if there's also an international angle you want to bring on this because... Um, we well, I mean, Lee, yeah, I mean, Lee's kind of raised it already, but I suppose, I mean, I would have, uh, I'd have two, there were two thoughts I kind of wanted to share off the back of what people were saying. Um, the first is in response to what Catherine was asking about whether or not it's expanded the political field. And I don't think it has um, expanded the political field meaningfully. So I think it's given kind of voice to deep discontent and to some, you know, it's kind of uh, diffused and I suppose let off steam insofar as certain kinds of people have been elected in certain places. Um, but that doesn't seem to me to... Um, that doesn't seem to me to be kind of have left any meaningful, real meaningful mark in terms of new institutions or new political configurations. So it's failed the test of expanding the political field, but that doesn't seem to me to be, you know, that seems to open up a new question, which is what comes after populism. So as people gradually, the discontented citizens and voters gradually come to realize that nothing will come from the promises that are made by populists and that they've, um, consistently failed to really meet any of the rhetoric that they gush uh, so profusely um you know where will where will discontent go and what will people look for and i think that is a much more um you know that's a much more interesting long term proposition and there are realignments happening beneath the surface right so the fact that trump seems to be disintegrating the democrats rainbow coalition that he seems to be winning you know systematically winning more and more black and latino voters at least if the polls are to be believed um and that just breaks apart um, the PMC stranglehold, you know, which is the PMC's kind of ticket to power is um, the identity politics racket. And if that if that voter machine simply isn't working anymore, then that is um, deeply damaging to the PMC model of politics on the left in the long run. And so, you know, that seems to me, again, that seems to me a positive, even if it's not something, if it's not necessarily expanding the political field. Um I think the deeper question, though, so I would frame, as far as the international context goes, I'd frame it slightly differently from what Lee said in this way. I don't think it's so much a matter of the size of the economies in terms of the way they conceptualize their constraints. So, you know, I mean, I think the real problem with um, Syriza, for instance, in particular, was an unwillingness, more than the fact that the Greek economy is so small, um, uh, or that the EU economy is so large by comparison, there was an unwillingness to um, brave the difficulties of national independence. Um, and again, the only place that you've seen the willingness to articulate some kind of break with um, transnational globalism as a politics is um, on any kind of significant scale outside of Brexit Britain um, is with Trump and with, Ameri with the promises, at least the rhetorical promises of America first. Um, and nothing really came of that, you know, um, but it's that I think is the significant difference. And that's not really a question of the size of the American economy, but more the political style of Trumpism, as opposed to the political style of um, the left populists who have no, have not indicated their willingness to, um, break with the prevailing consensus, which is to say based on globalist international cooperation and conforming to all the um, norms associated with the market structures of the last 30 years. So I think that's the kind of the, it's not hard constraints, it's more willingness to break political constraints. And it's only once we've broken through those political constraints, I think that any meaningfully, any hard um, constraints would actually um, become more visible.
I want to move on to the multipolarity question because I mean, so the issue there is that um, that sounds like when you raise it a bit of a kind of international relations academic question. But I think one of the most interesting questions for the next decade is how both multipolarity, but also the new Cold War, which is much more directly framed as a standoff between um, between China and the US um, as two capitalist competitors, it should be said, so radically different to the to the to the Cold War of the 20th century. But nevertheless, that that how that plays out in the internal life of nations, not just as a kind of international relations conflict, somehow out there in global space, but how that how that changes political economy, society and culture, politics within within the the, the life of those nations, um, and whether it also offers more opportunities, right? So one of the big questions has been debt, highly indebted countries, right, in, in, in the periphery. Are, are they given more freedom um, for maneuver to kind of play off big creditors against each other? Or does it get them into a mess where they're having to deal with a whole bunch of creditors at once rather than, rather than one or at least one which is unified, a creditor which is unified and led by the United States. Um, and then it just, I mean, there's just all these different ways that these things play out even culturally. So just in, here in Brazil, the news um, yesterday was that Bolsonaro fearing he'd be arrested because he already got his passport taken away, sought refuge in the Hungarian embassy, um, seeing whether he can be shipped off to, to Hungary, to, you know, Viktor Orban's Hungary um, as a way of insulating himself from from Iran. In the European Union, he's going to go to the European Union to seek safe haven. Well, yeah, I, I mean, exactly. You don't know exactly how that'll play out, and he's obviously an idiot. So, um, you know, he, he maybe wasn't. Uh, he, he was badly advised. But, uh, but anyway, so these things kind of splinter off in various different directions, and I, I think that's just one of the. I don't really have a have a proposal to put forward about what this looks like. More just the fact that I think we should be cognizant, especially in, for not in the United States or not in China, but in other countries, how that geopolitical competition ends up kind of transforming the political orderings within those countries as people try to, for example, chi parties emerge who are more pro-China and parties emerge who are more pro-US or ones who try to be non-aligned. These are all kind of facets which, you know, maybe seem like they're like a kind of funhouse mirror version of the 20th century. Um, Catherine. Well, I was going to save my statements for the multipolar world, but I feel like there's another kind of, um, there's another possibility within right populism, and it's happened already. I mean, you you mentioned Orban, but anti-Americanism in the world right now is a form of right-wing populism. And the left wing, like there used to be a global internationalist left that was supported by, you know, the big major communist party, the Soviets, and to some degree China. And without that kind of um, support and without an organized non-aligned movement, this kind of roiling anti-Americanism is was everywhere when I went to Poland. And one of the things that has happened is like all the elites of the EU and of the sort of American line countries, they go to university in the United States, elite universities. So the United States has exported higher education ethos, liberal arts education, through the indoctrination of a professional managerial class elite. When they go home, people hate them. Like um, working class people, ordinary people hate them. So you were going to move towards, Alex, a multipolar world. Well, within each local class struggle, and when you see like, you see this happening in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Germany as well, where the ruling parties, well, um, at least up until Tusk, uh, Tusk has won again, the ruling parties like in Germany right now, they're basically like watching Netflix all the time. They're watch. They're totally part of the new national security state, and it's interesting too because the Greens with Lee, um, the the critique of the Greens comes from like Wagen Connect, the far left and the far right. But they're totally part of this coalition government. They basically execute America's will in this tiny town in, on the border of East West Germany. In the when I was there, like right before the pandemic, they had like BLM banners. There's not an African American. Okay, there are Afro Germans, but they're not there in this town. Who are they doing this for? They're doing this to please the American State Department. But the popular, ordinary people, I would say the working class people, the people who don't go to college, who may not be able to afford streaming services, because that's all the Germans do, is stream American services, is they're really pissed off. And I feel like 
I'm more, I can understand their anger. And every left-wing person, every member of a left-wing intelligentsia should understand and identify with their anger and not be like, oh my goodness, you know, why are they so mad? I mean, these are beautiful banners here. Hmm. Anyway, okay, that's so, all I've got to say. D d d Alex Gurva, did you want to come in very briefly on multipolarity? Otherwise, we're going to move on because we've, we've got a lot to get to there. I was only going to say that I think it's probably one of the most important political developments in the next 20, 30 years because of the way it will restructure domestic politics in various countries. Not just right-wing populism, which will have to decide whether it's nationalist or not. It can't just do right-wing economics and throw the majority of voters just the culture wars and cultural transgression. It'll have to decide what it's doing economically, which will internally divide what right-wing economics and the, the relevant class interests. But also, I think it also for, you know, pretends the possibility of much greater violence. I think it's reasonable to see something like Ukraine as the pro, you know, as a country sacrificed on the altar of an emergent multipolarity. And if it's true, what you say, Alex, that it is potentially a kind of opportunity for different parties because they might have some greater degree of freedom if they can, if they have more than one debtor, more than one, sorry, more than one creditor. At the same time, you can end up getting used as a proxy for greater power rivalry. Yeah. And that not only transforms domestic politics into geopolitical ones, but it is a kind of loss of sovereignty. And so the most decisive question I think for the poorer countries will be whether they can reconstitute something like the um, international economic order or some version of that through the BRICS or some other way of organizing the, the global economy. Otherwise, they will just become proxies in whatever, perhaps it's the US versus China, perhaps it's three-way US versus Europe versus China. But I do think it's probably going to be the most decisive change that will find its way back in. But I think in a more, more likely to be destabilizing, whatever that means exactly, than stabilizing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think what might kind of flow on from this um, a little bit, um, especially in so far as it refers to industrial policy, um, I'm going to come to Lee now on, because we're going to move through now to, to leave politics behind, um, not entirely, but, you know, um, for the purposes of this, leaving politics behind for industry and economy. And so we're going to come to Lee on green capitalism, because it seems that one of the tensions there is industry versus austerity or investment versus austerity and how that actually plays itself out, um, which no doubt will be central. So Lee. Uh, actually, you guys can keep going for a second because my dog is just this second come up to me and asked to go out for a wee. So uh, <laughs> I have no choice. Otherwise, you'll wee on the carpet. Sorry, All right. We'll it's, that it's might the, happen to me later, yeah. It's the revenge of nature. You were just about to criticize right, right. the Greens and it's, you know, they have their agents. Yeah, very good. All right. Um, maybe um, maybe we'll do uh, work then, Alex Gurevich. Um, yeah, about, yeah. Talking about pro precarity versus militancy, or Alex, that's the way I phrased it. But why don't you go ahead, Alex Gurevich? Do the work. Yeah, do the work. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I was glad that you assigned me this topic because uh, I, I am writing a book about strikes at the moment. Book report. A book report? No. <laughs> that I can just ask uh, ChatGPT to do. Uh, so, um, and one of the interesting things about the way that the recent, I think we can call it a strike wave, even though in historical terms, it's still not that large. One of the interesting things about it is that I think it has brought people's attention to certain things about the politics of work and the broader questions around um, the development of social power that weren't there even a few years ago. So I think, you know, well, that past few decades, the standard conversation was about gig work, precarity, automation. Uh, it was about all of the ways in which workers were dominated in the current economy um, and sort of protesting the injustices. But in the end, they were sort of passive victims of this of, of the way capitalism organizes work. They're passive victims of exploitation. And that's why I think the conversation was about these things. And then the proposals were the kinds of things that you cook up in a seminar or in a think tank. Um, and I know that, you know, I 
interacted with think tanks about these issues. I teach classes about work and freedom and leisure. And, you know, it was the familiar stuff like basic income or fully automated luxury communism or whatever it was. This was the response to these bad things happening at work. And the problem with all of that discussion was it presupposed the very thing nobody had, which is social power. So you could talk about what we ought to do to deal with these injustices, but who is the we? Um, and, and that was why it remained primarily a think tank conversation and a university discussion about work that might occasionally influence actual power wielding officials when they were desperate to look like they were going to make comp contact with the working class. So I remember the French Socialist Party at one point when it was polling like under 7% decided it suddenly was going to kind of go for the basic income to try and look like it had something to offer. Um, but for the most part, you know, these were discussions on the left uh, in which everybody kind of dodged the central question, which is, so who's going to have the social power to overcome any serious resistance to dramatic transformation of the economy? And then all of a sudden you get strikes and you get labor militancy, and which happens against the background of these wider protests like the, you know, truck drivers in Canada or the Gilets Jaunes. What was interesting about these strikes to me was that they were a reminder of not just the fact that if you really, if you're on the left and you really want to transform the way work is done, you have to convince, you know, millions of people, you have to actually persuade them. Uh, and you have to persuade them to take, you know, immense risks to go on struggles like strikes that might lose might mean creating immense tension with family and friends, destroy their careers, or even just their possibility of employment. And that is a wholly distinct kind of political activity. And it raises the question of what you're really trying to win everyone to. Uh, and uh, it raises that not just because you've got to convince people to engage in the collective action, but strikes are ways in which workers actually exercise control over production and in which they are suddenly taking responsibility for an activity that uh, normally they don't have responsibility for. And I think that's vertiginous and it's a much more serious kind of demand actually than for a particular policy or a particular other way of organizing work. And so I, I think the kind of recent strike wave is, is interesting for the way it didn't just put the problem of social power back on the, on the table, raise questions for the left regarding how it's going to persuade people to actually back the policies that they happen to be interested in, but also whether you really want responsibility that is currently the power and responsibility that is currently exercised by managers and capitalists. And that kind of putting the question directly uh, kind of in that form was what was missing prior to the strike wave. It sort of vanishes as quickly as it, as it, as the strikes are over, because once the strikes are over, people go back to work and the standard relations sort of reassert themselves. But at least for the period of the strike, the question is, do you want to exercise that control on a continuous basis and have responsibility then for the outcomes, for the, you know, organizing production in that way, organizing work? Do you want to find ways of actually cooperating with people on a continuous basis where you can understand what you're doing is actually the product of your own activity rather than something just imposed on you? And those kinds of questions, I think, were wholly absent, almost entirely absent prior to this kind of strike wave. Um, and they kind of, they're, I think they're much more demanding questions. Um, they're, they're harder questions to answer. They bring up questions about not just strikes, but sort of democratic control and planning. Um, and perhaps they'll fade the minute people really have to confront what it means. But, uh, and my guess is at least for the time being, they probably, they probably will. But if it's true that, that work isn't just a thing that happens to workers, but ends up also being the site for struggle where workers start exercise, you know, asserting themselves, I think that would actually end up being quite an important and interest, probably the most important development, regardless of what it is that workers in the, in the short term end up demanding. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with that also, just because it would, I mean, firstly, it would cut through so much of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of left populism and right populism. Um, and particularly as that gets played out in a kind of culture war sort of framing that the, that it, um, 
it has a genuine unifying character. I wonder if there's any evidence of this also kind of being reflected culturally. I'm just thinking of two, maybe this seems a bit kind of um, superficial, but I'm thinking of two films which I saw recently, both European films, which haven't really seen the sort of, um, you know, mini strike wave that the US has, but I think both point to um, in, important questions in this. One is um, of an Italian film from 2021, um, E noi come stronzi rimanemo a guardare, which I think is, you know, us and us here as idiots just watching. Um, I, I think it's got a better English translation, but I couldn't remember the what it was called. But it basically, this is about a manager who, um, he's kind of a middle manager, successful corporate type who um, automates his job out of existence and suddenly finds that, you know, the managerial role itself has been automated and he ends up having to become a, a kind of delivery boy for, for an app. Um, and it, the film's not that good, but um, I think that points to the question of what AI is going to do in terms of a lot of professional roles roles which have a certain degree of autonomy or have had a certain degree of autonomy will either be automated out of existence or perhaps maybe more likely that um, increasingly people have to work for work for a machine, um, which is often the way that these things go. Um, and how that plays itself out in terms of a strike wave, for example, a lot of the enthusiasm about strikes and whatever have been in, if not middle class jobs, then at least jobs staffed by people who had middle class expectations and maybe have a university degree and who are downwardly mobile. And so, you know, uni uni unionization in Starbucks, for example. Um, the other film I wanted to draw attention to was um, a, a Franco Belgian film, um, which came out, I think, two years ago um, called. Um, called Rien à Foutre, nothing, no fucks given in English, um, about a girl who has recently lost her mother and is therefore um, pretty nihilistic and is a stewardess, or a, that's not the politically correct term anymore, is it? It's a flight attendant, I think. Um, but anyway, she um, is kind of just going out and partying, moving from, from city to city, um, as you do as a, as a flight attendant. And she's confronted by some trade unionists saying, look, we're trying to fight to improve our wages and conditions, will you sign up? And she said, sign up for what? You know, I don't I don't really care about improving my wages. I don't even know if I'm gonna be alive in a year's time, um, which I thought was a, a kind of a, a very sort of telling and, and um, poignant confrontation, um, you know, especially if you kind of read it metaphorically. Um, and so Ed, that also kind of points a little bit maybe to the ephemerality of, of what Alex was uh, gesturing at in terms of, more than gesturing at, but, you know, explaining um, in terms of how, um, there, there are these moments, but again, confronted with the responsibility, maybe there, maybe that doesn't kind of materialize in any kind of, um, you know, organizational form. Um, so anyway, I don't know if it wants to, to come in on, on this. Or if I, I would just to like to observe yeah. that having now cited an Italian and a Franco-Belgian film, you are permanently disqualified for complaining about the PMCs from now on. I, I don't complain I about that. Run around your cosmopolitan. That definitely, yes. I don't complain about the PMC. highly sort of uh, internationalist cultured bona fides. Um, you have yeah. spent at least three months drinking nothing but Kool Aid and eating Cheetos before you were allowed. To <laughs> they do it differently. They do it differently in Brazil, Alex. About uh, I, yeah, I'm sure they're watching loads of Franco Belgian. <laughs> In the favela, yeah. yeah I like yeah. the, uh, yeah, this is Plumbing pure, it. I can see, yeah. sp spicy pure rootless cheetos. cosmopolitanism. Sp spicy hot, spicy hot cheetos. I do have something to say, but someone should go, Phil, I think you were going to jump into. But it was only to, I suppose, because uh, there is something I think which kind of consolidates on the previous discussion, um, which is that the... Um, you know, that there seems to me like there's a word, if there is the the legacy of this kind of working class um, of greater working class militancy. It's also, I think, a tremendous opportunity because it's what you see politically at the same time as this is happening. You see, um, you know, the broad trend is kind of working class withdrawal from the traditional kind of social democratic center left parties. Um, as Michael Lind put it, you know, those parties are becoming what were once the parties of the trade union are becoming just the parties of the campus. Um, and so that link between the kind of um, old left intelligentsia or the, the left intelligentsia and the working class is being severed. And that seems to me, you know, um, uh, a cause for optimism, um, not least because the it's the PMC then um, are kind of uh, left to kind of spin off 
And I think it is partly that process is manifested in the craziness that we associate with PMC politics is precisely because they're not exhibiting any kind of um, restraint that would be imposed on them by large, powerful social organizations or by, you know, basic material demands. And so I think that's what we're seeing at the moment. Um, and I expect that will also be exacerbated um, through the processes if, you know, if AI does have this impact on white collar work that will lead to um, greater oversight, manipulation, um, automation, control, whatever, however you want to frame it. I think the response to that by an isolate, you know, isolated white collar strata who can no longer um, rely on the political support of voting machines that bring working class voters to the ballot box to support them, um, you know, that will manifest itself in ever greater forms of um, irrationality. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, I guess. It's positive in the long in the long term, but um, in the medium term, I think we'll have to kind of confront much more white-collar PMC insanity. Um, so can I, Alex, I found it so, Gorovich, I found what you said so uh, moving about the limitations and possibilities of the strike wave and whether or not the next step could be this concerted, continuous um, demand to reorganize capitalism, really. And I think there's, I'm just going to try to summarize very briefly about the limitations of, you know, what Amber has criticized with regard to, you know, white collar um, strikes. And at the UC system, they won an incredible um, contract last year, right? They raised their, um, the, some of them are not happy, but they raised their um, um, salaries, the graduate students and the researchers by 20 to 30% spread over two years, which is an incredible achievement. But does that strike have the will to go on with the reorganization of campus finances? Because we're all beholden to billionaires. Billionaires are much more dangerous to um, education than AI. Because of the austerity policies with regard to public education, we, every research one university needs billionaire donors and philanthropists. They get tax cuts. And then once they give you $150 million, like Bloomberg did with Hopkins, like um, people did at the University of Chicago, the hedge fund guy, the billionaire guy, Steve Schwartzman and Bill Ackman, bless his heart, thinks that they can rule what happens in a university. Um, it's a smaller scale. It's happened at UC as well. So what the um, what the non-transformation the of university finances and the untouchability of the billionaire class with regard to California has done is what the graduate students have won is now spun to us by the administration as more austerity for everyone. We're gonna have less graduate students, less of this, less of this, because you know they won such a good contract. They'll literally say this to you. Well, you know, we don't have that in our budget anymore. So this kind of press, a hardcore press, to destroy the power of the billionaire, to destroy the power of private equity, to do re massive social redistribution with the social power that Alex, you're raising, that you're raising, is is a long term thing, but also a short term thing. And is it on the table right now? I don't think so, because what graduate student politics militancy tends to go for as we've all discussed in very different ways, is niche politics, not mass politics. And so there is great cause for um, um, optimism as Phil and you both described, but I also see this real limitation. And then the young college educated person who is at Starbucks or who's organizing as a graduate student takes on all these other different kinds of reactionary, non-populist, -pop, non anti-mass politics, anti-working class politics, and absorbs it into their militancy. And meanwhile, you know, private equity and hedge fund guys are laughing all the way to the bank because I don't know if you've noticed, but the stock market is going through the roof, and the major and the nature of um, primitive accumulation in the hands of hedge fund hedge funds and private equity has not changed and they have so much power over what happens in america right now and this this strike wave does it have the will to go that far and say we need to break up blackstone we need to break up you know sequoia capital in california i don't know 
I mean, uh, you know, just to respond quickly to that. I, I'm, you, I wasn't primarily thinking about grad student workers. So the the overwhelming majority of workers on strike were in, you know, auto workers. They were delivery drivers. They were um, in Hollywood. They were actors or screenwriters. So uh, there were some grad students as well, uh, but. Um, I, and I don't think that their inability to challenge billionaires lies primarily in their particular class position. Um, I don't think anybody's in a position at the moment to really challenge them. And even when you think about what has to be done, I mean, let's be honest, the main reason that these grad students are striking for higher stipends is they can't afford to live anywhere near where they're working, like many other workers. And there's nothing that the universities can do about that because the universities don't control the housing market. And the housing market is a much- Well, actually they do, but that's a longer conversation. But actually so, they do, but- Not really, not in New York, not in Boston, not in LA, not in most of these places, you'd need a, 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 a body of workers much larger than graduate students who are able to control at minimum the municipal housing and zoning policy in a city to create, to be able to create massive amounts of affordable housing. Uh, and the real back, you know, the real background issue is there's so little social power, so little sense that large groups of people could actually impose their will at that level for that kind of transformation. And so for that reason, I'm sure there are things to, you know, there are certainly, I'm sure things to criticize about the grad student strikes in particular, or where some of them took it. I'm, I'm sure that's true, but to my mind, those are kind of local questions. They're, they're second order um, relative to the basic question of how politics shifts and what are the things that shift politics such that people think that large, seemingly intractable problems are in fact tractable. Well, um, let's let's kind of get on to one of those things. So, I mean, just to recap, we've done politics, right? Uh, specifically looking at populism, um, touched a bit on multipolarity, um, and now we're kind of in the industry and economy section. Um, we've done, you know, work, and now I want to maybe turn to Lee Phillips on um, on the question of you know green capitalism, or supposedly green cap coming green capitalism, whether it'll be defined by high rates of investment or you know continuing austerity, um, how that actually plays out, and that itself, you know has implications for um, indeed for the for housing, for example, as, as we've been talking about um, as well. Um, so uh, Lee, why don't you tell us your thoughts on this? Sure. I mean, I, I think this um, goes back to some of the um, the earlier conversations about um, just to respond to George's comments a while ago with respect to right populism and whether it's just a matter of pure political will or whether there are economic and institutional constraints on the uh, ability of of right populists or left populists to respond to the underlying economic discontent. And I mean, I would just say that I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive at all. Um, that uh, it's manifestly the case that um, Podemos, um, you know, uh, suffered from many self-inflicted wounds, as did Syriza, as did Bernie. You know, Bernie 2020 was different from Bernie 2016 um, with respect to PMC capture. And um, those, I don't, th those two things uh, go, uh, go together um, because uh, it is, I think it's manifestly the case that, you know, the Cypresses and Latvias of the world in, or in, of the European Union plainly do not have the same capacity to um, to begin some sort of grand uh, new, re, you know, new deal or industrial policy in the way that um, Biden was suddenly able to do because of, I think, uh, the size of the economy at the same time. Um, Biden's so responding to uh, to Alex's uh, broader point about whether build out will um, will win win out over austerity. I think that we have reached a moment where there is a, a fundamental break with at least the market fundamentalism that lies with the neoliberalism. Um, what I wouldn't say that this is the same as returning to some sort of interwar social democratic moment, 
but certainly the you know the inflate the U.S. Biden's Inflation Reduction Act is on the order of about 800 billion, just shy of eight, officially uh, just shy of 800 billion, uh, spending uh, on on climate um, uh, uh, and infrastructural sort of transition uh, issues. Uh, but there's some analysis, uh, some analyses put it at in the trillions precisely because this is in the form primarily of tax credits. And so many of those are uncapped. So it may actually end up being perhaps even larger than uh, the uh, the plans that were under discussion as part of an official Green New Deal under Bernie, where there would just be like there would be a set amount of spending um, that it's yet to be seen. Uh, but there's it's not just the Inflation Reduction Act. There's there's chips. So just this 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 past week, uh, we saw an, an, another announcement for another six billion of uh, to uh, to service uh, decarbonization of industrial processes and industrial processes are one of the really hard things to decarbonize this is one of the aspects that a lot of uh, the green left don't don't sort of focus on simultaneously vitally socially necessary but also just really hard to do in some cases we literally don't know how to do this yet so for example cement would be one where maybe just 10 to 15 percent of the the cement sector can be replaced by um, sort of clean cement technologies that we know about at the moment, the rest of the sector, just because of like particular properties of, required by cement, just it's a, it, it, we don't know what to do there yet. And clearly we can't have any infrastructure, new hospitals, new schools, homes without there being cement in the world. Um, so this is in many respects, um, the even though there is a, certainly a left critique of the Inflation Reduct Reduction Act and associated um, industrial policies where it certainly doesn't go far enough uh, along the lines of what many of us would like to see with respect to direct public ownership or even re-regulation of utilities, um, vertically, vertically integrated utilities. It certainly is a, a significant break. And I think that's that's permitted um, uh, by you know the rise of China um, and China's own forms of industrial policy. So it isn't just about Biden. On the other side of the, the aisle, you have uh, figures like Marco Rubio, who you know five years ago was calling for um, uh, vast new uh, industrial policy in order to compete with China. I think the the, the Democratic Party just com has completely bought into that. Um, secondly, it is a, a real response to the um, uh, the economic discontent that has produced Trumpism, global Trumpism. I think the the idea really is to, uh, to 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 build out new factories with, um, you know, delivering middle class, um, uh, sustaining jobs, community sustaining jobs, and hopefully begin to unionize um, some of those, uh, bring unions into the in, into the south. And I think this is just something that you know the Cypresses, the Latvias, the Greeces, the Italys just could not do on their own. But now because um, and it's it's a question as to whether Britain would be able to do that. I think perhaps Britain is of a size where it could if they had the political will, going back to what Philip was saying, uh, to do so that they, it, that could happen. Um, and um, yeah, so I think it's it's it, it's something that I think the left really should be leaning into and pushing in more of the direction uh, that we would like to see. Um, it's forced the European Union kicking and screaming because the, the, the senior figures in the European Commission who are as let's remember unelected um so they are much more um insulated from popular pressure are uh they've grown up they're absolutely committed to market fundamentalism so they really don't like what they're doing they constantly uh, denounce mm. the the ira as as mere corporate subsidies what's interesting there just as a side note is you do have some figures on the european left like daniel uh, gabor adam twos to some extent um that have a bit of a criticism of of, of the IRA, uh, and they sort of replicate the um, uh, the the European Commission's uh, neoliberal critiques of it being just mere corporate subsidies. I think so it's a lot more complicated. I, than that. I just wanted to jump in to ask. I mean, yeah. to and to relate this to what we kind of started off by discussing about a kind of ostensible incorporation of right populism. Insofar as that right populism is able to channel um, a lot of some discontent with um, bureaucracy, um, with kind of PMC sort of demands around ethical consumption, um, or indeed even like support for austerity, for green taxes and things like that. Um, in a way, it seems like the 
build out approach to responding to climate change, to increasing electrification, building out nuclear power, et cetera, whatever yeah. you might have, um, is that it's squeezed on kind of two sides, one by the kind of remaining neoliberal technocracy, which doesn't want to um, doesn't want to see build out. And then on the other side, by the reaction to anything kind of green sounding, often, you know, <laughs> often kind of well based um anger against that because it's read as being um it's read as being kind of you know punitive um and and the extent that you know if right populism becomes ever more kind of part of the furniture and is brought in house whether that acts as a, a break on kind of the you know industrial policy um a la biden's ira or or the rest of it i mean it depends where we're talking about i think there's much more openness within um the european right populace to uh, some of these uh, again, it depends what we're talking about. There is enormous uh, movement on, and I think quite understandably so, and the European right against the very technocratic, um, finger-wagging, eco-austerity that has been imposed uh, by um, the European Union and at national levels, and actually is in many respects celebrated by uh, by the activist movement Green Left um, from the uh, the Dutch uh, and uh, German uh, trucker, or not truckers, uh, farmers um, reacting against some really quite austerian uh, nitrogen pollution policies, which also relates to climate uh, pollution, uh, climate uh, change, um, to the to the um, to the gilets jaunes. Um, but the but industrial policy, building out new factories, um, that way to get to net zero, that's massively popular. Um, people do want good jobs back. Um, they do want to reindustrialize. That's true across Europe. That's true in the United States. The question is whether uh, figures within um, the, the, the populist right are all convinced of this. So I would say that um, I don't know if the AFD in, in Germany um, is fully um, decoupled from ordo liberalism. Certainly, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands is a strange amalgam of uh, of right populism around uh, immigration, uh, Islamism, um, and, uh, and the sort of bureaucratization of everyday life. Um, but also, is still he's absolutely a committed uh, neoliberal. Um, in Canada, Pierre Poilievre, the new sort of right populist leader of the Tory Party, which who will absolutely win the next election. Um, he's leaning into all of the, the sort of culture war stuff, but it remains very, very um, um, uh, neoliberal through and through. I don't know what uh, a new uh, Trump administration would do, which way they would which way they would go. Certainly, um, I don't think that there are the figures around Trump clever enough and knowledgeable enough with respect to the clean transition to 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 kin uh, to, to continue um the uh the, the what's been happening with the inflation reduction act on the other hand um i i think it's broadly good news um there is something new going on economically uh radically new that uh, we haven't seen for about 30 40 years and the question is whether the left is able to respond to that and carve out a better space for it unfortunately i think a lot of the the green left and the left in general which has been sort of where so sort of green uh degrowth sort of ideas, eco-austerity more broadly, has very much metastasized right across uh, the left. And in, instead of responding appropriately to pushing uh, further into um, industrial policy. Um, thankfully, I yeah. think um, yeah. um, the, the, the sort of degrowth stuff outside of that left bubble is incredibly unpopular. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. But it's true that for all the left's anti-neoliberal stances over you know the past decades uh, when push comes to shove on the green stuff though <laughs> the lean neoliberal effectively um i think we need to move on we, i mean so we've been now kind of in the industry and economy section and trying oh, to tease sorry. out what the tensions are yeah go on quickly can i just say one thing because we're talking about the uh, sort of prospects of the future i do worry about what's happening on the the, the green left where in the wake of all these defeats, the uh, um, Sanders, Corbyn, put Amos and so on and so forth, there has been a radicalization of, of the left, particularly around climate issues. I think in uh, um, replacing um, um, their hopes that they had um, placed on Sanders and so on and so forth. And so we are seeing sort of not just a degrowth um, capturing the, the imagination of the green left, but sort of Andreas uh, Malm's um, how to blow up a pipeline, sort of eco saboteur 
anarchism. Just you know, last year, um, a group, a very large group of uh, environmental activists in France sabotaged a cement factory um, due to climate reasons. I don't know exactly what their 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 the goal there is because if you, we don't have cement. We're not going to, as I said, we're not going to have homes and houses and, and, and schools and, and, and infrastructure and so on and so forth. At the same time, we don't know how to decarbonize a lot of it. And then just last week, um, or I think it was maybe two weeks ago, um, certainly this past month, um, in Germany, this new, well, it's not that new, it's been around for a while, but certainly there's been a pivot, the Vulcan group, it's called, and they 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 torched an electricity pylon. Um, um, uh, that was servicing a new gigafactory, a, a Tesla gigafactory. Now, this is incredibly dangerous to, to local people in terms of if you cut you cut off a, a supply of electricity, you're you know potentially shutting down hospitals. Um, and um, the fact that more and more of the the green left is is celebrating this, like there was an article in Jacobin magazine from uh, Jonas Thiel critiquing this how this is utterly cut off from um, ordinary workers. The, the workers of the Tesla factory demonstrate in defense of their factory. Um, and that article, um, uh, there was such an outcry within Germany and the Netherlands that they had to, uh, that Jacobin um, uh, Germany had to publish an article defending this eco-terrorism. Uh, so I do think that uh, there's some real, real worries moving forwards about a revival of a sort of, I don't know, not a red army faction, but a green army faction. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, especially as, as these other kind of promising, you know, areas which were promising under the banner of left populism um, fade away. We're going to move on. And one of the touchstones in industry and economy was was tech. But actually, we're going to deal with that in a sort of tangential way. So talking about art and ideas, one of the, um, just to set, set this up, one of the things that has really struck me is obviously the, the way that artificial intelligence, particularly the creation of images, but also the large language models has accelerated um, in, in a very short period of time. And what looks like um, going to be, I mean, what looks like to be coming over the hill very soon is the idea that the image, which has been taken as um, kind of central to culture, but also as, as you know, primary evidence of something actually having happened, um, is no longer going to hold, it seems, right? If anything can be a deep fake, as I put it. I mean, just my notes, you know, post majority image over the word, you know, we're no longer literary culture. It's all about, um, you know, this constellation of images. And is that going to, are we going to leave that behind because of AI that we don't trust images anymore? And what is the impact um, of that even on, on art? Anyway, um, these are all really big questions, but I think it's something which is going to be fairly central over um, coming years as we navigate this sort of new reality. Catherine. Um, I don't think we should ever trust images. No one should have ever trusted an image. An image was only a document when um, Bertillon started using photographs to create system grids to identify criminal um, features. It was a nephrology thing. So, Alex, I don't like the modern technology known as photography really found its use at the end of the French 19th century in police photography. And so it was always about surveillance and finding, and it was also very eugenics and social Darwinist because he photographed like all the prostitutes on the streets in Paris and tried to find out like features in women that would give them over to prostitution, totally ignoring the fact that maybe they needed to make money for their families. But um, the other the, the other thing I like that I'm very Old Testament about this too is that um, the culture industry thinkers Horkheim and Adorno said that um, there's a way in which fa the fascist thinks in images, and I always loved that. Like, okay, it's very Judaic, like the Jews are the people of the word, and we are the inheritors of an intellectual tradition, and we are the people of the word. So we should always be skeptical of thinking in images, of taking images as documents of reality. I mean, if you think about the first deep fakes, they were probably like um, the Shroud of Turin. I mean, maybe that's real. So I don't know. I got the, um, the uh, jury's still out on that. And um, I was once 
like, and Alex G is going to get me on this. So I, I will have to be eating Cheetos for a month too. But I was at this little tiny church in like remote sweet Switzerland, right? Switzerland, you know, backwaters is one of the most pagan places in the world. And allegedly this church has not been changed since the ninth century. And there was like the, a kind of um, a freeze of the life of Christ. Uh, you know, um, still preserved on the wall of this church. And I was thinking about like the shepherds who are like living these really tough lives in these mountains. And they come to this church. And one of the most incredible things about it is reading the story through images. So this, the image has always been like a propaganda tool for dominant class. And those, and so the um, priestly class, I, you know, these poor stupid peasants, they can't read, shepherds, they can't read. We're going to illustrate, you know, the life of Christ and we're supposed to worship that. And I do, and I believe, you know, in some ways, like we should have like a um, total blanket suspicion of any image as any document of any kind of reality, of any kind of referentiality. And there you have then art that can be freed from referentiality. So I'm like a high modernist and a Talmudic Jew at the same time. But that, so I hate this kind of inflation of the deep fake thing. I'm so paranoid though that I don't, I don't even take this myself, my paranoia seriously though. I have one of these rear view cameras on my car, my green Prius, as, as I've ever noted, but I like to look back in my mirror because I hate looking at my rear view mirror camera because I'm like, that could be a deep fake and I could be driving over a cliff. So I need to check it out at the same time. And I recommend that anyone who has any of this kind of technology just use IRL things like look back with your, turn your freaking, as as long as I'm able to turn my head, I'm going to turn my head just to check on the deep fakes. So there is that question. I mean, for the Hollywood, for Hollywood as a, an industry right now, the promises of like all technology is that it will be, um, saving wage work it will lower the cost of wages because they can generate ai figures and they can act in films and stuff like that i mean i know sag is that was one of the reasons why they went on strike so if it's a work related thing i think ai has to be regulated and controlled but with regard to a consumer end thing i think we need better propaganda on the left and i think to um, instill a kind of generalized skepticism with regard to the way we we read images, and it's a, not a bad thing to be just like don't believe any images, don't think about, don't think in images. Understand that this is industrially produced content. On the one hand, on the other hand, there is contemporary art, right, and there is fine art, and I believe that the aesthetic with this offer of sensuous immediacy will never be replaced by AI because AI fucking sucks as an artist and it does not give you an experience of sensuous immediacy. Um, that said, you know, um, this goes back to the Green Army faction that Lee was talking about. For some reason within like left liberal, the hierarchies of the world, fine art is still really, really has a sacrosanct and sacred place because that's why all those is it Extinction Rebellion or whatever, the people who like threw soup on the Mona Lisa and a defaced um, um, Van Gogh's irises. This Just is part oil. of those kind. Just Stop Oil. Just Stop Oil, right. So it obviously still has like fine art still has this iconic um, um, importance, but only to like a class of people who believe still in some kind of aesthetic hierarchy. I find it... Um, a terrible politics, but symbolically speaking, yes, this does go back to the idea that, you know, um, the painting as an image still um, has a really important function in the sort of cultural sphere. So we do, I, I like to go back to Guy Debord and say, you know, it's all spectacle. We live in the society of the spectacle, late capitalism, less so by postmodernism because it didn't give us play. It has trapped us in this question of spectacle. We can hardly escape it. And part of my um, um, sort of skepticism about AI has to do with the fact that the way to counter it is not through paranoia, like raw paranoia, but through a generalized mobilization around like more 
um, skepticism and criticism of content in general, which is not to say that we should not be entertained by um, the culture industry products, because it's one of the few things that does give us some pleasure in life. However, this question of sensuous immediacy has been completely and systematically reduced by, um, by um, the technologies and the screens, which is another reason why the sort of bourgeois fetishist um, or the PMC consumer, you know, I include myself among them, have fetishized this notion of cooking. And the bear, there are a lot of cooking shows. The whole book, the whole thing about the bear, the very popular streaming, you know, show in the United States, focused on fine dining, was that we're trying to revive sensuous immediacy through the screen media. Mm. And I, I, AI is trying to create this kind of immersive environment where you can find that kind of sensuous immediacy. But if you're not, but we, it means that we're all fundamentally cut off from these practices that are, you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years old, and they're packaging it into spectacle. The question of narrative is the same thing. One of the problems is that the consolidation of publishing, the film industry and everything else has made us, you know, um, consumers of pretty mediocre art at this point, mediocre narratives, um, narratives with a very punitive function for their um, reader like Barbie, you know, second wave feminism. I hope second wave feminism has completely been discredited by that film. That's like my hope. But um, I don't know if we want to talk about that more. But <laughs> Barbie has given us the image of second wave feminism in America Ferrara's monologue about, well, you know, let, women's yeah, liberation. Let, let, let's not do let's not do Barbie um, here or perhaps ever because the moments may be gone. But um, uh, that, that's to be seen. I don't know if anybody wants to come in on this, but I, I think one aspect of the perhaps or disbelief in image and a lot of the things that Catherine was touching upon is this notion of, of the return of the mystical, the magical, um, even indeed of the indigenous, which is folded into that. Not to say that the indigenous people are mystical or magical, but that's the way that it's often um, interpreted today. And we had a ep recent episode on on contemporary art um, in which this came up, in which our, our, our guest was telling, talking us through how there's this turn towards these things in, in art today, away from the kind of big spectacle, the big superficial spectacle of a lot of contemporary art and towards mystical and the magical. And I wonder if there's... Um, not something deeper culturally going on here, you know, beyond the kind of relatively um, distant worlds of contemporary art and whatever is happens at Art Basel or whatever, um, but something deeper, a deeper cultural transformation in line with this. I don't know if anybody has any comment on that or indeed or anything that, that Catherine said. Lee? Wait, can I clarify your comment? Just a question. So people are turning to the mystical in the art world or outside of the art world? In the art world. Um, so art is turning towards mystical, <clears throat> magical, indigenous, native, primordial, etc. Um, but I'm I'm wondering whether there isn't also a, a kind of deeper cultural shift away from reason, perhaps even in reaction to an overweening rationalization of life. Um, we're going to get on to how that relates to sex in just a second. Um, but uh, Lee. So I'm going to play the vulgar materialist once again on AI and art. And my and, and this isn't a I, I i don't have a uh, hypothesis here i the, again these are just questions because we're talking about the future and what's going to happen and i'm wondering um you just can't you can't make a lot of money um on with on on ai art like the you know google and so on and so forth can um open ai can charge nerds playing D&D &D, 20 bucks a month to produce fantasy art uh, on demand, but that's that's not where the big money is. And that sort of community of, of, of consumers is, is very tolerant of any failure. So like if the troll that they want um, um, uh, produce troll art uh, has six fingers uh, rather than five, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. The D and D players are going to be perfectly happy with with uh, with the art that they produce. So it's low risk with, married to, uh, and, and also if there's five, there's six figures instead of five, nothing bad really happens in the world. It's it's so it's both low risk and there's a very high tolerance on the part of the um, uh, the, the consumer there. But that's not where the money is. Uh, uh, the real money is going to be in uh, places where there's um, high risk. Um, and very low tolerance of, of uh, for, for failure. Things like enterprise uh, software, um, surgery, uh, um, 
and healthcare uh, medical diagnoses. If a if an AI uh, misdiagnoses uh, somebody, um, that is a huge lawsuit waiting to happen. Um, um, Self-driving cars is another um, one which we, it seems like it's just very difficult to to achieve, but um, uh, it that's where the huge money would be is to eliminate um, uh, human drivers from huge parts of uh, the transportation system. That's a that is enormous sum of money potentially to be made, but it is enormous. There is uh, the, any failure mode is incredibly expensive, potentially uh, shutting that down. Um, now, what's interesting here is that in almost all of these cases, if you add humans to the AI, humans checking to make sure that the AI isn't failing, um, then uh, then you reduce the uh, the risk and you um, you reduce uh, you improve the, uh, the, the 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 risk tolerance there. Um, but now you're not making as much money because you're actually making something even more expensive because the whole point here is you want to save on labor costs if the uh the the new model or the like super duper version of uh of surgery and, and medical diagnosis and enterprise software is humans plus ai then that's incredibly expensive particularly because we've got to remember uh that um the way that we're delivering this is uh enormous amounts of compute which requires enormous amount of energy whether it's dirty or clean is almost a secondary at this point and that means it's an incredibly costly. Um, and so we really have, we're living in an era, like a, a few, maybe just a few years or uh, uh, maybe even a few months of a sp of spectacle. People are very familiar with, oh my God, suddenly computers can make kind of okay fantasy art. Uh, but I think the, it is, I don't know, I'm, I shouldn't be as confident, but I, I guess my question is, will it be the case that uh, moving forwards in the next couple of years, um, capitalism will be able to um, uh, to swallow that increased cost of humans plus AI to to really deliver on the on the promise of uh, of artificial intelligence. And I don't know if that's that's necessary. Oh, and I guess one other thing along these lines is that one area where we already are seeing some incredible um, uh, delivery deliveries from artificial intelligence is within scientific discovery. You know, the protein folding problem was. But it was for, for, for years was thought this is humans will never be able, it's, it's too complex for us to for scientists mm -hmm. to, to resolve. And then suddenly uh, AI is able to do that. But here's the thing. Once again, um, uh, you can't charge scientists a lot of money. And basically what's happening at the moment is all this venture capital is subsidizing these discoveries. If the the only way that you can uh, that is that is, is viable is um, scientists that can't spend much money and uh, D&D players who won't spend any, much more than 20 bucks a month, then it might just be a bubble after all. Okay, so D&D &D is not art. That stuff is not art. <laughs> it's not art. I'm sorry, but it's just not art. That, maybe, that's the fantasy. I maybe, mean, it's, yeah. The, I think I'm the venture capitalist, the venture okay. capitalist model must be that every single player in the world is a D&D &D player, and that's right. how this um, right, actually right, makes any right. money. <laughs> no, I, I, so so I, I just wanted to move to move us on because um, we okay. have to deal with the the last kind of category that we have here: individual and society. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here which could be teased out. So the vulnerable subject um, and the idea of victimhood um, and how resilience seems to kind of combat that. And that seems to be a, a hot idea at the moment and how that plays out. Um, there's questions of um, virtualization um, versus face-to-face -face interaction, probably most prominently in, in questions of education, but it, it plays out in a whole uh, different realms of life and work and so on. Um, but I think a lot of this can be condensed actually in the question of sex. Because I think, which, which is why I'm um, kind of bring Amber in here in a second on it, but um, sex, sexual relations, romantic relationships seem to condense a lot of these different tensions. Um, you have a, a, the uh, issue of sex recession, which has been widely discussed, um, loneliness crisis, people increasingly atomized, um, the incel phenomenon, which continues. Um, and at the same time, you also have this rationalization of intimate relationships. Um, 
it went viral recently that someone made a flow chart of their birthday gangbang. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, well, you can Google that if you like. Um, but, you know, the kind of the way that a lot of this rationalization seems to be very inimical to any kind of notion of, of spontaneity or genuine intimacy um, and whether there might be a backlash indeed against that. So uh, anyway, An uh, Amber, why don't you come in? Okay, um, so it, I'd start out by saying that again, I'm I'm speaking more from the the anglophone world here. But as I understand it, some of this discourse is starting to show up in universities in China um, and in France. I doubt it's made it to Russia yet. That's going to be that's going to be you know you can't get through Russia in the winter. Um, but I, I do think in terms of um, social movements, we do, um, we d America is, there is kind of a, a unipolar thing there and we do export these things. Um, I know a lot of people in, quite a few people in Spain who were very upset by the Me Too movement. I know a lot of people in, in like um, African immigrants in the UK were sort of upset by the saturation of Black Lives Matter because they were like, well, that's, that's American, not like it's American cultural hegemony, particularly in the activist world. It doesn't really make sense. So I don't want to project, but I do think we tend to export these things. And so it's worth at least discussing it in terms of, of um, you know, America's the shock troops for uh, sexual politics across much of the world. Um, so I, everyone talks about the, the basic stuff, this, the, you know, gender being um, or, or women uh, matriculating at a, at a higher rate than men, um, delaying families, delaying marriage, uh, you know, particularly the PMC is becoming more and more pink, as they say. Um, although I'm sure that will, I mean, pink collar, but let's be honest, that's, that's going to get interpreted one way and it should not actually, it's, it's, um, it's actually a very diverse, uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, development in terms of like, you know, uh, sexuality and, and race and things like that. But, you know, women are starting to man the helm of the NGOs and the universities and, um, the cultural institutions like publishing, but I would say the interesting thing about, you know, you know, Me Too is kind of it's 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 over. I'm not sure if it was, um, you know, the Amber Heard thing or a few women overplaying their hand or it's the end of uh, it's the end of Trump. So it, it just felt less urgent and maybe it'll come back or the fact that all those chicks doing that just have corner offices now and it doesn't matter as much. Um, but it has and I've been I've been thinking about this for like the past week or so because i read an article and i think the me too woman has um has uh, sort of receded uh but there has been this rise of accusation of the pick me girl and i'm not sure exactly uh if anyone has heard this but it's it's very memeified there's a whole bunch of uh a uh, whole bunch of uh, think pieces on it over the past year or so. Before that, there was a there was an earlier thing, I think during the Obama years, called like the cool girl or the chill girl or whatever. And the idea was that it was, um, you know, these were traitors to women because they were actually sort of falsifying, um, uh, you know, a, let's say a nerd or a jock or these traditionally like masculine things, um, you know, in order to impress men, which is very funny thinking that you need to do anything to impress men. Um, that's not even like a, like a, a, whatever corny sitcom joke. It's just, it seems very silly that a woman would have to, um, you know, it, ape masculine hobbies or affectations or interests to get male attention. They've never had to do that before, but apparently, um, but yeah, I think you see a sort of re-feminization of everything and a very anti-masculinity push. And I don't mean like anti-man, I mean like anti-masculinity as an affect. I think the accusations of like a pick me girl really reverse the kind of um the kind of um, second wave thing of like women don't have to have like a commodified beauty or or a particularly feminine affect 
Um, and then, you know, I, I remember when wearing a bunch of lipstick and putting on, um, you know, a, a skimpy dress meant that you were trying to appeal to men. Now it's, you know, I read comic books or, or play video games or, you know, I'm into sports or whatever. So it's been this real reversal of what it means to be a traitor to women, which is very funny. We just keep swinging like maniacs in various directions. And it's strange, too, because it's also like very uh, heteronormative in this time of like kind of ubiquitous queerness, because it's like. I mean, I'll be honest, as someone who's been accused as being a pick me girl, I miss being a teenage girl when they all just called us dykes. Um, it's it was it, it was almost like the blatant homophobia, accurate or not, was more preferable, um, less insulting than being accused of appealing to men. But it's kind of a and and you know there's a few like there's a little bit of backlash coming from it in terms of like teachers and child psychologists where they're like you know it kind of doesn't matter like like who cares if they're like first of all there are butch girls um second of all i think like there was one point when we all sort of decided we had like you know we integrated the 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 disparate states of girly girl and butch girl like i thought that that happened but there's this sort of regression happening and i think it has to do with the kind of anti-masculine um you know sentiments that are arriving in like the liberal left again very strange it's also what you know the joke I made was like, there's someone watching Jodie Foster walk up to a softball play like John Wayne with hip dysplasia going, oh, what a pick me girl. Um, but it's a very strange shift. And is it, is it the Bernie bro? Was a Bernie bro a pick me this girl? This is what I was going to say. Yes. I remember very specifically Gloria Steinem saying that a lot of women were voting for Bernie Sanders to impress men. <laughs> Which it was very, I, I just remember we're all like, shut up, con. Like, it was like this very kind of like vicious, like if you're going to use that kind of like gendered argument against us for this, like, you know, very restrictive social conform conformity that because of women's sort of rising PMC status and, and their, um, you know, rising status in sort of, uh, you know, the cultural sphere and the professional managerial class is now not, it's not that it's not being enforced. It's just that men aren't doing it anymore because we're in a post-patriarchy world. It's like a vast kind of like feminine um, enforced no, social. No, but uh, when I was coming up in the world, the worst thing you could be called by a feminist was male identified. So it's the same thing. It's police yeah, and femininity. Yeah. Well, it's like, it, it just keeps swinging identified. back and forth. It, it yeah. does make me think whether, you know, I mean, we're all dealing kind of with these archetypes. And it seems that the more digital life becomes, the more wedded we are to these archetypes as a way of understanding each other and talking about cultural right. phenomena, political phenomena. Oh, this is the blank type of person um, into which people right. are then, you know, real concrete human individuals with all their contradictions are wedged. Um, and that seems that that I wonder, does that continue? I mean, is there a backlash against the kind of digital existence in which we're, you know, it's just these kind of floating archetypes and, and people aren't actually their, their real selves, you know, and then all their I, complexity. I think actually, yeah, accusations of inauthenticity are also hilarious um, in the digital world um, since everyone is now even more corporation of one, they're their own sort of like PR. Every, every Zoomer is now um, like a, a child actor. It's terrifying. But again, I think it's interesting that all of this stuff exists it's it's to me it's about the rise of women not so much the decline of women but of men or whatever but it's manifested as a kind of it's nothing but contradictions um it's it's barbie movie it's like actually to be a real feminist queen you do this but then also there's queer girls but then that's you know you can't be too butch because actually you're trying to appeal to men but then men that are toxically masculine are still a problem. Uh, so one gender norm is now progressive and the other one is regressive. And, and this all exists in terms of, um, or in, the, in the, the context of relationships and declining marriage and all that stuff. And the you know, neoliberalization of, of sex and relationships and you know, polycules and basically Uber for you know, the, the, the apps, you know, Uber for, for romance. And I think we don't know 
in terms, you know, we talk about sex, family, the economics of it, but I think all of it has resulted in this idea that we don't know how we feel about gender right now. We're just completely schizophrenic about it, uh, which means that we don't know how to feel about sex and relationships and marriage and family. And, um, oh boy, are we not doing great with it? Uh, it's, it's a kind <laughs> of, it's a, I, it's a universal schizophrenic yeah. identity crisis. George. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're talking about, I guess, the individual and their place in society in, in the coming decade, you know, there's, I think what Amber said about, you know, confusions over over sex and gender, it doesn't seem to me that there's straightforward answers to these. I think all the things, all the kind of things that she outlined, those just will, I would imagine, would, would develop, uh, can well continue to develop over the next decade. But I did want to come back to this I guess this this point that you you raised earlier, not about the you know the virtual versus the in real life kind of um, conflict or tension within the individual and society, but this one about vulnerability and resilience. I think this you know this is one um, I think site of real potential conflict, um, particularly around what would it mean for everybody to be not just a vulnerable subject, but I've, I've made this point in the podcast a few times before, but a vulnerated subject, i.e. not just at risk of being harmed, but actually being harmed. I think this is one trend which I would see as as really, well, I don't want to be too fancy about it, one dialectic <laughs> that you can see um, continuing to develop, but like one trend that will, that will deepen. I don't think there's, I don't think it's reached its kind of end point or its peak yet. And I think this is really important for, not just how we understand ourselves as individuals, although that's obviously a pretty important thing, but also for the kind of to circle back to, you know, what are the possibilities for politics of of right populism or less populism or left po populism, however you want to to frame um, that. And it's you know the the injured subject is in a difficult position doing politics. We're not, you know, it's no we can no longer be taken for granted. I think that we stand in the position with relation to society where we can act politically. So I think this is one, um, you know, one thing which I I think is going to set the scene potentially, I don't want to be too negative about it, but could set the scene for, you know, the politics of the, of the coming decade is how do we handle, for example, mental health crisis amongst young people? Like, will we, will that play itself out where we see a kind of inherent illness paradigm be, you know, be one of the kind of cultural social bases for politics? If so, that potentially has a very different sort of politics attached to it than the kind of standard enlightenment, you know, can do whatever you like sort of subject. Um, I don't know, maybe we can recover that and maybe we can't. But so I did just want to flag that kind of vulnerability, resilience or vulnerability, vulneration um, kind of um tension within the individual society is one that i think is definitely worth um keeping an eye on for listeners in the coming decade you yeah, know i think that might be a nice place to to leave it actually um and to wonder yeah, maybe to restate a question that george put but um whether politics becomes anything more than groups uh, appealing for to the state to recognize their victimhood but actually to see through their interest and vision of how the world might be um so anyway, this has been episode 400, um, looking at some of the central social, political, economic, and uh, cultural tensions of uh, of the next decade. Um, so this has also been a rare episode when we've got everyone together, all seven of us. Um, and so we've obviously tried to cover a lot of ground to kind of speak to different uh, areas of interest and expertise that we all kind of collectively have or in, you know individually have. We can bring uh, bring together um, in a in a in a context like this. Um, it's also, um, I think, you know, as, as this is a sort of anniversary episode, a sort of statement of issues that we'd like to push out and go deeper over the next period. So um, please obviously let us know what you think. Um, no doubt you'll scream at us for passing over a really obvious issue that we forgot to mention, um, but that's okay. This is meant to be a, a sort of ongoing discussion and debate, um, not the kind of final word on things as ever. Um, so we hope you'll join us at, at, at uh, patreon.com slash bungacast. There's always a lively sort of debate in the comments there um, when we try to respond to those that are on a regular basis basis um so um yeah thank you for that um thank you for being with us and uh thank you in particular to alex uh, alex g amber catherine 
and Lee. Please rate and re- review the podcast if you feel so inclined uh, and tell your friends about us. Uh, we, uh, we're we pretty excited about uh, the, the, the coming period, um, even if it's uh, politically not seeming that hopeful. I think it's important that we um, look at it with, with clear eyes. So that's what we're going to try to do um, and with help from, uh, from our new contributors. Uh, so we'll catch you next time. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye.